Hello and welcome to the video. Today we're going to be exploring an interesting graphics technique um, which basically allows us to take regular images or textures and convert them into this kind of interesting wave representation. Now this is something we're going to be doing like on a pixel pixel basis kind of drawing pixels but you can easily take the same technique and apply it to a shader in a, in a sort of a graphics environment like if you're making games or if you're uh, building other kind of programmatic shader driven GPU stuff. So I think it's a really interesting uh, technique and um, it's actually going to take us into a lot of uh, really interesting mathematical concepts like how sine waves work and how we can do all kinds of like uh, numerical mapping in order to do signal processing essentially uh, that takes in the signals in the forms of pixels and output signals in the forms of waves. So it's really interesting. I hope you enjoy. Let's get started. Okay, so here we are in the browser. And what we actually have here on the left hand side is our input image, our test image. This is just a Game Boy Color on a white background. It's kind of a good, in my opinion, a good kind of image to use this uh, as a test. It's got enough contrast. It's on a white background, which is kind of nice. It allows us to, to kind of pop something out from, from, the, from the background. And on the right, we have a canvas. Um, and this canvas doesn't have anything on it right now. It's just white. And we are going to somehow kind of take the information, which is over there in the pixels of the left-hand side and, and put them in this kind of decomposed waveform on the right-hand side. Uh, okay, so that's the setup. Let me show you the code that I have to write this because I wrote a little bit of boilerplate code ahead of time just to kind of allow us to focus on the important stuff. Basically, this is the JavaScript file. Um, what we do is we grab the image, we wait for it to load. Uh, then we actually extract the pixels from that image by creating a dummy canvas um, and drawing the image to the dummy canvas. So when I say a dummy canvas, I mean one that isn't drawn to the screen. It's just there as a kind of programmatic object for us to manipulate. Um, we uh, draw that image, then we can actually use one of the uh, canvas context uh, uh, functions called get image data. We can use that to extract the pixel data. So this is basically the roundabout way of um, getting the pixel data from the image. And then that gives us this uh, array of pixels here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna log this um, pixels array out to the screen and we can take a look at its form. Uh, <clears throat> and just the rest of this is just kind of setting up the canvas. So it's just, you know, taking the width and the height that we got from that image, setting those as our kind of constants for the, uh, for the window, uh, sorry, for the canvas setting up the canvas, drawing a white background, and setting our stroke color to black. That's it, that's pretty much everything that we have. Then we have this empty draw function that's not doing anything. So if we go back to the code here, if I pop open a console and I refresh, and we go into this console, well, what we get is um, a UN8 clamped array. So this is one of the special kind of typed array uh, uh, objects that we have in, in JavaScript. Um, is basically a a typed array for the u and 8 type and if you try to write a uh, value which is higher than 255 or lower than zero it will just get clamped at those extremes so that's kind of how that works um it has 200 what is that two million eighty thousand elements and if we kind of look at the size of this image so the game boy width is 800 times the game boy height Uh, we get um, 520,000 pixels of this uh, of this thing. So this is it's quite a bit larger. And actually, if we if we take that whole thing, and we multiply it by four, um, we'll see that we actually get the the same number. We get this 2,080,000. And that is because for every pixel in our pixels array, there is a red, green, blue, and alpha value. So there are basically four values per um, per pixel that we're going to deal with. So that is, uh, that's that's it. That's our kind of raw information. This is our signal in, right? This is what we're going to take and somehow process so that we get a, um, a different effect on the output. All right, <clears throat> first things first, I think we need to take a little divergence. Uh, a divergence is basically the content of this, this episode. We need to understand how waves work. 
this is um, going to be fundamental to this uh, to to this whole thing. And as it turns out, waves are they're they're not that complex. That's kind of a math joke there for the math people. No, but um, the waves are actually they're not made up of uh, huge numbers of components, right? There are really only three things we need to understand about a wave in order to really properly be able to apply it to something. So I've, gra I've grabbed some drawing material here. This is uh, the mathiest slide that we'll look at, but you've probably seen this image before, right? If you studied high school trigonometry, you have probably seen this image or something like it before. Basically, this image tells us how the sine and the cosine function are related to the idea of a circle. Right? And the reason that that's important <clears throat> is because when we talk about sine and cosine, the stuff that we're kind of plugging into those functions is actually an angle, right? That's, that's what we're plugging in. We're plugging in an angle. Um, and the angle is relative to this, this circle, this like this plane that we're on and kind of like this, this sort of unit circle. So in this image, what we have is uh, an arbitrary line marking out a, a, an angle. Um, and this line is, we, it has the radius of the circle, right? And we just say that the radius is one, right? So it's something called a unit circle. So it's not hugely important for now, but just keep in mind the radius here is one. With those constraints, if we have this line going out with this angle and we take the sine of this angle with a radius of one, or the radius doesn't matter for the angle, what we actually get out, the value of sine, is the length of this line as it drops down to the vertical axis, uh, sorry, this horizontal line that goes through this horizontal axis. So that is what sine is. Sine is just the length of this side of the triangle that gets made up. That's it. That is, that is what the sine function is. And the cosine function is, uh, is basically uh, where where this horizontal line would meet that sign, uh, that sine line. That's it. That's what those two functions are. <clears throat> that is what they measure. And as we, as you know, the the or may maybe not know, the the value of the sine function it goes between minus one and one, and the same as the cosine. And that is because that we have this um, these dividing lines. Kind of, if we set the middle of the circle at zero, so over here, since this is a radius one, this would be one. And over here, this would be minus one, right? And down here on the vertical axis, this would be minus one and this would be one. So you can see that as we kind of like measure the length of this line, we're kind of also signing it based on um, which, you know, which quadrant we end up in. Or, or rather which, uh, like which half of, of the, the end we line up on, depending if we're sine or cosine. So that, that I think is a really useful thing to keep in mind when you do this. Just imagine now, right, that we are sweeping this angle across the circle. So um, the length of this line, if we start here, right, if the line was, this line was going on the horizontal and it wrapped around up to here, what we'd see is that sine line grow and grow and grow and grow and then get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And then grow and grow and grow and grow, and grow again, but in the negative direction and then get smaller and smaller and smaller towards zero in the, uh, in the negative direction. So what would that look like if we traced it out? Well, it would look like a sine wave, right? That, that is what we would see over time. So sine waves are actually just values over time. Like, that, like when we think about a wave, we think of it being a value over time, or at least a value over something. <laughs> because uh, time is often represented by space in, in drawings and things. If you think about an oscilloscope, if you're measuring a signal or something like that, <clears throat> what you're actually seeing is you're seeing a value over time, but you see time represented as the horizontal space. So as time goes on, you're drawing a different point of the sine wave, like, and you're just evaluating where your angle is across that. <clears throat> okay, that is like, in essence, that's the sine wave, that's it. Um, so the first thing I want to do, actually, is I just want to draw a sine wave to our browser window. I just want to draw a sine wave that goes uh, from the middle up here, goes up to the top, then down to the bottom, and then meets back here over on this side. That's it, just a regular old sine wave, one cycle, and starts here, takes up the entire screen. So how can we do that? If we go back to the code here, um, 
what we're going to do basically is we are going to iterate. So for let x equal zero, uh, while x is less than the width of the screen. So we're going to go for every pixel of the screen, x plus plus. Then we are going to essentially figure out like what the angle is that we are, what we're measuring here. And now we need to, we need to have a little think again. Because what we're actually talking about, right, is that we have kind of a, if you imagine this is our screen, don't worry about the Y divisions and things like that for now. If this is our screen. What we're actually talking about doing here now is taking a sine wave where we kind of, we take the angles, we want to take every angle around the circle from here all the way back around. That's going to be one cycle, one time around the circle. Um, but we want to map that idea of being like this angle, this pixel over here, being related to like this angle here, and then this angle here in the middle being related to this part of the screen in the middle. And then finally, all the way back around the circle at this end of the screen. So we want to somehow like uh, map angles around the circle to distance along the screen. And how can we do that? Like what is, what is the relationship there? Well, that is where we can get into something called linear mapping, linear interpolation. Linear interpolation is one of the most interesting and useful things you can learn about if you're going to do any kind of graphics or any kind of like programmatic, anything that you want to do with numbers, like linear interpolation is one of the most useful tools you can learn about. Um, it's, it's so powerful. It's ridiculous. Um, all right. So the basics are incredibly simple. Like if you get the idea of it, uh, it's, it's incredibly simple. So basically imagine this, right? You've got this function lerp linear interpolate, you get a time and that's kind of like, we often call it time, right? But it's just, you can think of it also as a percentage, right? Like how far from beginning to end am I through this arbitrary thing, like from zero to 100%. And then you get like a place that you're trying to map to. So you can imagine in our case, this goes from zero up to two pi, right? Cause we're talking about going from zero uh, around to two pi of the of the circle. So we've got a range A and B and we've got this percentage and we're basically saying like, hey, if I'm like 50% of the way or 60% of the way through, like what does that mean? Like where would I be on this on this scale here from zero to two pi? It's as simple as that. That is like what it is. It's basically saying like, imagine I've got a range of numbers. What is 50% through that range of numbers? What is 30% through that range of numbers? That's what linear interpolate does. And this is the formula. So you take A, you always have A because you that's your minimum value. <clears throat> then your maximum value, you add your maximum value. So that's B minus A because you've already you've already gone along A steps. So like the distance from here to here is actually B minus A, of course. So A plus B minus A, that gets you this full distance. And then multiply that by either z like anywhere between zero and one. And obviously, if it's if you multiply this uh, expression by zero, you'll just get a right. A plus this thing is going to be just a. And if it's one, well, now b minus a plus a times one that gets you all the way to b. So that's how this works. Like there, there's no special like you you can play around with this formula if you want to try and get a, an intuitive understanding of it. But that is linear interpolation in a nutshell. Now, the more generalized and kind of, but arguably more useful version of linear interpolation, which is just linear interpolation as well, like that's what I want to get across here, is um, a function that I call map range. And the idea of map range is instead of just saying, um, hey, I've, I've got some value between zero and one, and I want to map that to some arbitrary range like zero to two pi. Well, now instead, what we've got is a number that goes between some other range, like maybe zero to the width of my screen. And I've got another range that I'm trying to target, like zero to two pi. And I've got some value which is in the middle of my screen range. And what I want to say is like, how can I interpolate a number in the, the range of my screen to a number in the range of something else that I'm choosing? So basically, you don't quite have your number in the right format. You don't have something in this zero to one. Instead, you've got it in some other arbitrary range. So that's what map range is taking care of, right? And you can see that this side, or if you squint it, this side of the equation over here is actually just exactly 
this part, right? So it's it's this uh, part of linear interpolate. <clears throat> so basically, what what we're doing here is we've got some range a to b, right? Which may or may, like the idea here is that a has some potentially arbitrary offset from zero in either the positive or the negative direction, right? That's I've drawn it positive here, but it is actually arbitrary. Um, so you can imagine a could be zero, right? That's that's possible, but a could also be 20 and B would be 100, right? So you wouldn't have this this like already zeroed uh, point. The first thing you want to do is you want to shift your number, shift your range so that it actually does start at zero, right? And the way that you do that is that you, you say, okay, well, I've got this new range now that I'm going to think about and that's going to be start at A minus A, which has to be zero. And then the other end of it is B minus A. So we're just like offsetting it backwards, basically, we're moving the whole range backwards so that it starts at zero. And then the nice thing about that is that if you had this value, which we'll call V, uh, this value V, well, in order to kind of figure out where that falls on this new range, you just need to take V minus A, right? Because you've, you're moving everything back by A. So, you know, you move A back by A, you move V back by A, and you move B back by A, you just shift everything backwards. And now what you have is something which is in the range 0 to b minus a, and everything is perfectly still mapped. And remember, our aim is to get something in the, the 0 to 1 range. So how can we, we then figure out what v is in relation to 0 to 1? Well, we just need to take this v minus a, which is our shifted v, and we need to divide it by b minus a. And this will work, right? Because b is like the maximum value, v minus a, uh, sorry, b minus a is the maximum value, v minus a is like how far we are from zero to this value. So this will give us a value between zero and one. And then we can just plug that into the regular linear interpolation function. So this is like what we've done. This gives us zero to one. Then we plug that into linear interpolate and bam, all of a sudden we're able to map something that goes from some arbitrary range into some other arbitrary range linearly. So that's it. That's how that works. And um, now we have all the math that we need for this episode. Like this is, this is pretty much it. I'm going to talk about sine in a bit more detail, but we already have the essence of sine, right? We're just going to figure out a few of the tricks that we can do with it in order to, you know, take full control of it. Okay, so with that in mind, let's go back and let's figure out what our angle is. Well, let's write these two functions up here first, actually. Const lerp equals tab. You can write these arguments in any order you want. It doesn't really matter. But basically, this is t times a plus a plus b minus a. That's lerp. And then map range. Well, I like to think of that as a as a v, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so we have a, b, c, d. We're going from a, b, and we're going to c, d. So what do we have here? Um, we've got t minus a divided by b minus a. That gives us our zero to one. And then that's just something that we can plug into lerp. So we're gonna lerp up to C and D. That's it. That's how those two functions are implemented. So what we're gonna say is that our angle here is map range and our T here, that's gonna be our X position. And we're gonna take X, which we know goes between zero and the width of the screen. And we're gonna map it from zero to math dot pi times two. Now you might think this isn't like the most simple calculation in order to do this, right? There is a, it's probably a simpler way of doing it since we know that both the both ranges already start at zero and all of that kind of stuff, but it is the most general way of doing it, right? And what I'm trying to show you in this is not the most efficient code because you can write more efficient code. What I'm trying to show you is that there are these really powerful tools that you can apply and I want you to recognize when you can apply those tools. So don't worry too much about efficiency. If you want to do it more efficient, go ahead. That's fine. Okay, so now we've got an angle and what we can actually get is our sine value now. So we can use math.sign and we're going to plug in our angle. That already goes between 0 and 2 pi and then we're done. All right. So then we want to plot this to the screen, right? We've actually got enough to make a wave now. So how can we plot this to the screen? Well, if we if we go back here, 
and we go to this y division. So what we want to do is we want to have something that kind of starts here in the middle, goes all the way up to the top of the screen, and then all the way down to the bottom half of the screen. So in essence, each half of the wave takes up half of the screen. And what we can say is that the amplitude of the wave is half of the screen, right? That's, that's the height that we can get on either side of the, uh, of the wave. So we're gonna call the amplitude, we're gonna call that height divided by two. So now when we actually come to plot a point, like the point of this sine wave, <clears throat> we're gonna call this point, um, well, it's just gonna be at X, right? Cause that's, that's the point where we're drawing it in the kind of the time domain, so to speak. And the Y value is now going to be um, this like centered offset, which is gonna be also height divided by two, the middle of the screen, plus um, the sine value multiplied by the amplitude. So that's, that's the point of this sine wave, right? So we could actually dr just draw a whole bunch of points, but instead what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have a, a previous point, and the previous point is just gonna be at, um, it's just gonna be at, like behind the screen in the middle. Like So we're just gonna draw from this point to this point, so we can actually make like a nice line. The way in which we can do that is to call the line function, which is part of microcan, which is this little library that I've brought in up here. It's a tiny little library that I wrote to abstract over drawing on the canvas. It makes life a lot easier. So we're gonna draw from our previous point to our point, and then we're gonna set our previous point to our current point. All right, that's it. Let's go and draw this and see what that looks like in the browser. So I'm gonna refresh here. And what we've got is a nice clean sine wave, right? Um, so drops down, goes down to the bottom, then goes up and then comes down. So that's it, that's, that's a sine wave. And we've understood one of its key characteristics here, which is amplitude, right? A regular sine wave goes between zero, uh, minus one and one. <clears throat> and if we multiply that by some other arbitrary amplitude, we can change the, the vertical size of the wave. It doesn't change anything about its horizontal characteristics, keep in mind. It only changes that, that, that uh, um, vertical characteristic. What about if we wanted to have uh, something else that you think about with waves? What, like one of the main things you think about with waves is frequency, right? And the idea of frequency is the number of cycles per second, right? So hertz, like how many hertz is this wave? Well, in our case, this would be a one hertz wave, right? Because it's like one cycle across time. And remember, we're treating our horizontal uh, you know, canvas as time. So in this case, we go from zero time to one unit of time, like one second, let's call it. We have one cycle over that. So one cycle, one hertz. What about if we wanted a different frequency? What about if we wanted a 10 hertz wave? So 10 cycles per second. Well, let's see if we can figure that one out. So now let's have give ourselves a frequency value and we'll call it 10, 10 cycles per second. Well, now what we actually have to do, all we have to do, in fact, is to take our angle and multiply it by our frequency. And that is going to give us um, a different frequency. So let's plot that out. Refresh. Now what you can see is that we have a sine wave that has 10, uh, 10 cycles. All right, so this is actually like, we almost know everything we need to know about waves. <clears throat> and in fact, we know everything we need to know now in order to just build this effect, right? But there's one more characteristic that I would be in remiss if I didn't talk about, and that's phase. Um, so phase is the last uh, sort of key characteristic of a wave. And the phase is basically just like, I have this wave, I've got this wave on the screen, right? And you can see that it kind of starts in the middle here, right? Um, but I mean, we could have a wave of a certain frequency with a certain amplitude, but instead of it kind of starting at this point, we could instead have it start at this point, you know? So we could just shift the whole thing back a bit and have it start here and end at the same point. That's perfectly valid. And the wave would be the same in every other respect, right? We'd measure the same frequency, we'd measure the same amplitude. The only difference now is that we'd have something called a phase offset. That's all phase offset is. It's just, an, it's just how far the wave is shifted left and right. So phase is also measured in angles, right? It's because if you think about what a phase is in terms of like 
this thing. It's basically like some, like you're just pushing a little bit of an offset of the angle into your uh, into your sine calculation, right? That's that's it. So we also measure a phase in uh, in in degrees or in radians rather. <clears throat> so let's um let's do a phase offset here, and let's make our phase offset. Um, let's animate it. Maybe that will be something that makes it kind of easy for us to 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 look at. So I'm gonna set my drawing function up so that we clear the screen every time we call it. So that's what that background is gonna do. And then what I'm gonna do down here is called request animation frame. And we're gonna pass in the draw function. So we're gonna recursively call draw using this window uh, animation API. And that is gonna allow us to kind of track this animation over time. So <clears throat> let's give us ourselves a variable called time t. And with that t is going to measure an angle over time, right? We're just going to keep wrapping, wrapping around uh, angles. And so um, I'm just going to create a thing called phase. So this will measure, I guess this will measure frames. And our phase is going to measure like, uh, I don't know. We can just take some arbitrary divisor of that frame in order to get an angle. So let's take our time and divide it by, um, I don't know, 30 frames. So like... It's, it's giving us this smaller unit. So what we do for a phase is we just add it to this angle times frequency, right? It's just some arbitrary offset point. So that's what we're going to do. And then at the end here, before we um, request animation frame, we'll just uh, increment T. So let's go and take a look at this. Let's see how that looks. If I refresh now, what you can see is that we're actually drawing this wave over time now, right? It looks like we're seeing this wave continuously and all we're doing, of course, is we're adding a phase offset, so we're shifting the wave uh, as time goes on. And of course, angles, they're, they're measured in radians, and although this thing keeps going up and down, um, like, uh, sorry, although this angle is growing over time, it still just kind of wraps around on pi times two. So we're just wrapping around the circle again and again in terms of the angle that we're measuring. Um, that's not always true. Like uh, there are there are some complexities there, literally complexities that go into how waves are represented and, and the wrapping around. You can also think of it being kind of a helix, like a spiral. That, uh, so there are, there are things to consider there, but we're not going to go into any of that stuff today. Right, so this is it. We've learned everything we need to know about waves to, to perform this effect. And we know everything we need to know about linear interpolation in order to be able to kind of take full advantage of it. All right, so what I'm going to do for now is I'm just going to um, I'm just going to comment out the animation stuff because we don't need to do any animating for now, and let's just uh, go back to this screen and talk about how this effect is going to work. Like, what is the essence of this effect actually? So what we're going to do is we're going to take all the pixels of this image. And before we do anything, we're just going to work with just the brightness value of the pixel, right? Just like a grayscale value. Um, we're not thinking about colors like RGB. Instead, we're going to think about like how arbitrarily bright is this pixel. Um, so you can think about that as grayscale, right? It, it's in grayscale, you don't have colors. You just have a value that's either, you know, white or black. And you're somewhere along the, the range of those, those colors, right? And the reason that we do this is just because it gives us a really th easy thing to map, right? A really easy thing to interpolate. Because now we've got something that has an arbitrary brightness from black to white. We can map that into some other arbitrary mathematical thing, right? That we can use to represent. So um, that's what we're going to do. We're going to break these pixels down into grayscale values. And then what we're going to do is we're going to kind of scan through. We're going to divide the screen up into a bunch of horizontal divisions, right? So this is why I've drawn on this one. This is basically kind of what we're going to do. So we're going to give ourselves a bunch of these lines on the screen like this. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw waves on all of these lines. So we're going to have a wave that goes up and down on this line. We're going to have a wave that goes up and down on this line. We can have a wave that goes up and down, so on. And the way that we're going to be able to sort of like take the image is we're going to modulate that wave based on the grayscale value that we measure on the pixel. And when I say modulate the wave, um, there's actually a bunch of different ways to do this. This is where we start getting into the idea of this being kind of basically signal processing, um, because we're taking, um, we're taking the signal in 
and we have some other signal and we're going to modify our signal based on some other signal. So this is called modulation. We're going to do something called amplitude modulation. So amplitude modulation is the idea that you vary the amplitude of your fixed frequency wave um, by some by some arbitrary amount. And you actually encode information by changing the amplitude over time. Let me give you an example of how this looks. So let's go back to the code for a second and let's take our wave and let's try to modulate it. Let's try to um, change how this looks a little bit. So what I'm going to do is instead of um, making our amplitude fixed, instead we're going to have a, an amplitude which changes over time. Like we're going to modulate that amplitude. And how are we going to modulate that? We're going to use map range. And we're going to take in our um, X position. So we're also going to modulate based on the X position. Um, and based on where we are in that wave from zero to, uh, to the width of the screen, we're going to either have um, uh, the zero uh, amplitude or we're going to have the maximum amplitude. And this is the maximum amplitude. So let's do that. If we now plot this, uh, on our thing, what we have is a wave that starts out very, you know, with zero kind of zero power and gets kind of louder and louder, as so to speak. If you were to play this through a speaker, like it would be a thing that it starts quiet and gets louder and louder. So we've haven't changed anything about the phase. We haven't changed anything about the frequency. All we've changed is the amplitude. We've modulated the amplitude. Okay, so we can do this um, arbitrarily. So this is just like some linear thing that we've done. What about if instead of just taking the point on the, sorry, the amplitude point of X, what about if we we took X to be a, um, uh, to be a, like a, something that we could plug into the sine function, for example, so math.sine. And instead we, we, uh, we modulate this value. So X is actually still a pixel. We basically need X to be um, to be uh, to be an angle. Um, so where we are on X. So what we actually want to do is we want to modulate the angle, um, but we want to have a different frequency. So we're, like, because if we modulate on the same frequency, it's, it's, we're not going to see anything <laughs> interesting. So let's modulate uh, based on like um, the frequency divided by seven. Right, that's going to give us a different frequency of this wave. This now goes between minus one and one. And let's have a look at what that does to the amplitude. So let's go back here, refresh. All right, so what we can see is that, um, you know, the mod uh, the, the, the maximum amplitude of the wave is kind of is kind of changing quite a bit here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to exp I'm going to make the frequency a little bit higher. And We'll go back and we'll see how this plays out on a larger scale. Maybe let's also bring the maximum amplitude down a little bit. Let's make that height over eight. So what we can see now is that we've kind of we've encoded like another wave basically inside um, our existing high f higher frequency wave. Um, now this is where the magic comes in, right? What I want what I want you to imagine is that we have a bunch of these these waves, right, going across. They're all at a fixed frequency. But as we go along and we scan the pixels, we map the the grayscale value of a pixel, which goes between say zero and two hundred and fifty-five, we map that to an amplitude value that goes between zero amplitude and whatever the maximum amplitude is. And we may want to invert that because zero here means it would be the darkest color and um, 255 would be the lightest color, it'd be white. And maybe if we have white white background, we want there to be zero amplitude. Um, and if we have black like this, we want there to be a much higher amplitude because that's where, where, where there is pixel, where like there is a pixel contrast, right? Uh, that's where there we can think of there being as like something bright uh, well, not bright, the opposite of bright, dark. Um, so we want to bring that out by actually sort of exposing a height, like taking up more pixel space, basically, 
with a uh, higher frequency wave. So this is how this is going to work. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to break down the screen into some fixed number of uh, lines. And this is going to, this is basically a kind of, you know, um, downscaling of the image you can think of. And we're going to do this for every line. And we're going to basically figure out where we are in the image, go and look at the image, figure out its grayscale, val grayscale value and kind of draw a wave based on that. So enough discussing it, let's basically get to the, the good stuff. So first of all, we need to iterate through our pixels, which we now have red, green, blue alpha values for, and just get a single value, right? Just a single uh, grayscale value. So I'm going to create a, um, uh, a variable here. I'm just going to call it capital G. And we're going to basically create an array which whose length is width times height. And I realize if I want to do this, I need to do it uh, below where I've defined width and height, which makes sense. And for each, uh, each of the values inside this, we're going to take its index and we're going to figure out like uh, where the interesting information is in the pixels and compress it down. So you can see that what we're making here is an array which is four times smaller, right? Because we know that this one is width times height times four. This is just width times height. So um, to get the pixel value, so this is the, going to be the, the uh, let's call it the pixel index. The pixel index is whatever our, our actual index is times four there are each each time we go through one of these there are four values to look through and then we can get the red pixel value which is just in pixels uh, pixel index plus zero right it's just there is the first one I'm gonna use plus zero because it will be obvious in a second the gray uh, the green one is at plus one and the B is at plus two we actually don't care about the alpha pixel sorry, the alpha value, because we're not going to deal with it. Like our image doesn't have any transparent pixels. If you had transparent pixels, you might want to account for that here. So like to keep that in mind, like if you're going to do the same kind of technique, uh, you might want to take that into account. Also, by the way, you don't have to do use grayscale, right? Grayscale is just something I'm using now because it's, well, it's the easiest thing to, to process. Um, you could just use one of the channels, right? You could just use the green channel, or the red channel. You could actually create waves for all of the channels and then you would get yourself like kind of a color image, like by layering up red, green and blue together. That could be an interesting effect. Um, yeah, there's all different kinds of things you can do. So experiment with this. And if you do experiment, leave me a comment and show me what you've done. I would, I would love to see it. Um, so what we're going to return here is just the average of these red, green and blue values. and before anyone gets at me in the comments, right? Um, I know that just taking the average of a red, green, and blue color um, is not actually an accurate grayscale for like in terms of human vision, but it is just the simplest thing that we can do right now. So if you wanna be like really color accurate, you need to take into account like the fact that the human eye does not see uh, each color, red, green, and blue at the same uh, fidelity. So if you actually wanna account for that, you can do that. Uh, I'm not going to. So we're going to take R, G, and B, and we're going to divide them by three. All right, we're going to get their average value. That's going to give us a value between zero and 255. And uh, yeah, that will be enough for us to, to go on from here. Then, uh, basically, what we're going to do here is we are going to, we're going to have another measure of something. So we're going to have the measure of like how many of these um, how many of these vertical lines do we have? So it's kind of like that's our, our vertical resolution, so to speak. So I'm just going to create a constant up here. I'm going to call it um, I'm going to call it the h divisions, the number of horizontal. Uh, I guess it's vertical divisions, isn't it? I get. I guess you can think of it like I'm thinking each of these being like a horizontal. Oh, it's a height. Yeah, that's why I'm thinking h. In any case, you could think of it being both. <laughs> It shows how important naming is. It sh shows that this is a bad name, but I'm going to continue anyway. So how many H divisions are we going to have? Let's have for now, like we'll just make 20 because I think it will be like, you know, easier to see. And let's say that each of these H divisions, H, H division size 
the size of each of these divisions is actually going to be the height divided by um, the number of divisions that we have, right? So that's going to give us like how big each individual division is. And what we can derive from how big each individual division is, is like how much of a maximum amplitude can any wave take up? Because if you think about it, right, we're going to have a wave that, um, uh, we're going to have a wave that like is, is on this one. It can only take up half of the space, right? It can only come till down here and go up till here because the wave, this line below it also needs to have a wave that comes up halfway. So we need to have a way of figuring out like based on how much space there is here, like what's my maximum amplitude of the wave. So we're going to derive that from this h division size. But first of all, before we do any of this, let's just comment out this code and let's um, just draw the lines so that we can get a sense of it. So for let y equals zero, uh, you know what? I'm not going to do this in terms of y. I'm going to do this in terms of um, the division that we're on, the h division. So while that's less than the number of h divisions that we have, uh, h div is less than h divisions, h div plus plus. So now we're iterating through the number of uh, lines that we have, and we're going to derive kind of a base y position from that. So like, where where are we drawing? Like, is it uh, you know where, like how do we map the number like zero here to this this value? So the y position is going to be, uh, what, what we could say is it's just h div times by the h division size, right? So like which one are we on and like how far along it are we? But I'm also going to add in half of the h division size, right? And the reason that we do this is because like we don't want the first line to be up here at zero. We want the first line to be like, you know, some some level down from that. We don't want it to be all the way uh, at zero. So that's why we're going to add an offset. Okay, so now what we can do is we can draw just some lines from one side to the other for each of these. So let's draw a line that goes from uh, x position zero at this y coordinate to uh, x position the width of the screen to this y position. Let's draw that. And we'll go in here, we'll refresh. And now we've got a bunch of horizontal lines. And if we counted them out, we should have the right amount. And so we're going to draw a wave that goes along this line, a wave that goes along this line, etc. So let's do that now. Let's draw a bunch of waves. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break out up here um, the frequency because actually each of these waves they're going to have a fixed frequency and the reason that we're going to do that is because we're modulating the amplitude you can also modulate frequency and yeah? that's something you can do um, but we're going to modulate the amplitude because i think it will probably work better for this effect although if you do end up making the same effect but you use frequency modulation instead of amplitude modulation let me know in the comments i'd love to see it all right, so the frequency that we're going to use here, let's just arbitrarily choose 50. I, I don't know if that's good or bad for now. I'm just going to choose it and we'll, we'll see how it is and tweak these parameters a bit later. All right, so to draw a wave, well, we know how to draw a wave. We're going to basically do this stuff. So let's take that code and we will embed it inside here. And our previous point, well, now we don't want it to start at h divided by 2. Instead, we want it to start at y, right? We, y is the like the base sort of vertical position that we're dealing with. And at any given point, now we've got this idea of um, this is our maximum amplitude. I think what we want to do is let's break out max amplitude here. We we'll call it max amp. Max amplitude is actually the h division size divided by two, right? And that should be, I think it should make sense why we do that, right? Because if you look up here, like this is now half a uh, division and we want to draw up to that with a wave up to the top and then back down to halfway down so that this wave that goes here can come up halfway and go down and none of these waves will overlap each other. Overlapping the waves is also an interesting effect. You can also do that. We're not going to do that for now. Um, so that's going to be our maximum amplitude. So let's come in here and, and replace this with max amp. 
And I guess we don't, for now, we don't want to do any frequency modulation. I guess we could. There's no reason we couldn't. I think this should already work. Let's get rid of frequency there because we already have it. Phase, it doesn't matter. We can use phase here, but uh, we're not interested in it, in fact. Um, all right, let's see how that looks. Let's see if we've made any mistakes. So I'm going to refresh. All right, that's it. Now we've got a whole bunch of uh, frequency modulated waves, uh, sorry, amplitude modulated waves. Um, yeah, that looks pretty good. So you can see now this is going to basically, and I'm going to take away the modulation just for a second so that we can see. Um, because what I want you to see is like what our base kind of like, what our base canvas is, so to speak. We're going to get rid of these lines underneath. They're just to show where the, the H divisions are. Basically, you can imagine that if we had a fully black image, um, let me just get rid of those lines so that we can see it really nice and clear. If we had a fully black image, like this is kind of what we would see. If every pixel was black, this is the idea. This is how it would look in our, in our representation. But now what we want to do is, as there are like white pixels, we want to make that amplitude smaller on each of these possible waves. Like as we like, basically we're going to scan across like these parts of the image, figure out like what the value is at those parts and modulate that amplitude based on that. So um, this would be a fully dark image if we made all the amplitude zero. So now I just make this zero. Well, what that's going to look like basically is a whole bunch of lines. So that would be a zero amplitude. Um, and somewhere in the middle would be if we had a, you know, a medium, medium dark image. And you can see that basically by doing this, uh, we can, we can change like, uh, yeah, we can change like the brightness at any given point. And of course, as we increase the frequency, so let's do that. Let's increase the frequency a bit. Let's make it hundred rather than 50. As we increase the frequency, we're going to basically get more like kind of fidelity. We're going to be kind of zooming closer and closer and in on the idea of just like drawing pixels. Um, so, you know, to balance the effect, we don't want to go too far in one direction. We don't want to have too high a frequency because that will, you won't see the wave actually at some point, And then it will basically be just like drawing a crappier version of the image, um, which I guess this is in a way. Um, Likewise, we also don't want to have too many vertical divisions because um, the closer and closer you get to having like just the number of pixels that you have, like the number of vertical pixels, like at that point, you also don't really have a wave anymore. You've just, you're just drawing in pixels there. So at some point, the whole thing will collapse into just drawing the image again. We don't want to do that. We want to have some, some middle ground, which is nice. All right, that's it. Let's actually get to this. Let's, let's do this. So now what we're going to do is we are going to, um, uh, what we're going to do at this point is here, before we start, like, um, like the angle is going to remain the same. The phase is going to remain the same. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm just going to bring phase out, put it up here and set it to zero for now. We can modify it later maybe, but for now we'll, we'll break it out. The angle is going to be the same. The sine value is going to be the same. We're just going to be figuring out what amplitude to, to go here. So let's actually figure out, first of all, um, like what grayscale, what grayscale value uh, in this array does like this point that we're dealing with here with Y and X, like what does that correspond to? So the way in which you can take, because uh, remember, this is a, a one dimensional array like so like all the pixels are just like crammed into a single one dimensional array we don't look in by x and y in order to get to a single one dimensional index uh, so this is going to be the gray index in order to get to that index we we need to take the the y position and uh, y at the moment because we're just like arbitrarily um like dividing and multiplying is not going to be like a nice round number all the time. So let's do math.floor to make sure that it is a valid integer. We're going to take that, we're going to multiply it by the width, and then we're going to add our x coordinate. And if we do this, this is going to give us the index, the pixel index into this grayscale, grayscale value. And you may already be noticing at home that like a lot of the grayscale 
pixels here are just going to be completely ignored, right? Because like we're only dealing with things along this line. We're not dealing with like all the many pixels in between these lines. That's very true. We could only compute those and, and leave it out. I'm just going to compute all the pixels and ignore most of them. <laughs> all right, so now we've got an index. What we can actually do now is to create the amplitude by taking that grayscale index, which we know goes between 0 and 255, and map it between 0 and the maximum amplitude. But just like I mentioned earlier, because 0 is the darkest value, and in the darkest value we want the highest amplitude, I'm going to swap these around. So we're going to, at, at 0, we're going to have maximum amplitude, and at 255, we'll have 0. Now, Depending on how this goes, we, we may basically be done at this point. So let's go back. Let's refresh the screen. That did not work. <laughs> that didn't work at all. Um, why did that not work? Is it, because, is it because I'm like, oh, I think I know what it is. We always need to add C no matter what. Like the problem is that this C, yeah, actually order of operations does matter. Yeah. <laughs> because like this is what we're multiplying by and then we're always adding this offset of C. Okay, that's stupid. <laughs> Refresh. Oh, look at that. Look at that. All right, we've actually got something. <laughs> Thought I was going crazy for a second. Okay, it's not quite high fidelity yet, but we 100% have the like the sh basic shape of the Game Boy here. And you can even see that we've got like, um, clearly like these are the buttons here where it's a bit darker. Clearly like there's a button here. Clearly there's like the grate over here. Uh, this looks like the headphone jack down here and the the secondary like the power input so like we've got something you can even kind of see the screen and if especially if you squint you can actually see like most of the most of the image in there we can actually make this a lot clearer by playing with uh, some of these parameters like the division size and the frequency so let's just add in more divisions let's go up to 60 divisions I don't know so we triple the number of divisions that we have And that's looking good. I mean, it's difficult to see, probably, and I hope YouTube is doing, doing us the right, you know, the right service here. But it's definitely in there. I think if we if we invert the colors here, this will probably make a bit of difference. So instead of going um, white on black, uh, black on white, let's go um, the other way around. So let's go black and draw white. All right, so I'm going to go back to the screen, refresh. I think that's looking better, but it's kind of hard, it's still hard to tell. If we increase the frequency, we'll also, uh, we'll basically increase the density of pixels that we have. So we'll be able to um, see that a bit. So let's take off frequency and let's go for 150 instead of 100. Let's go back, refresh. Oh yeah, I mean, now we're, now we're getting somewhere. I hope you can see this. Um, I hope there's like, it's kind of clear here because I think on this scale, it's a little bit tricky to see, but yeah, I mean, if I look at this and YouTube's compression is not completely washing this out, I'm going to zoom in real far. Um, yeah, you should be able to, should be able to see the image of a Game Boy there. So that's it. We've actually used a signal processing technique called amplitude modulation in order to bring about um, the pixels of this image into uh, into this wave form. I think this is a really cool effect. Um, and we can just go one step further, just quickly. Why not? We can go one step further and we can actually animate this. Um, so let's bring in our request animation frame again. Um, and now we're going to compute, we are going to compute phase. So uh, the phase, let's, um, 
let's have the phase be per frame. So phase is just going to equal t divided by 30 or some other some other uh, value, but that's fine for now. And uh, let's go back. And what this is actually going to do is it's going to have those wav uh, those waves basically moving as we're going along. And I have the feeling that maybe maybe something went wrong, or maybe it's just really um, really slow. Could that be it? It is, it is moving, but it's moving really slowly. So let's amplify that effect a bit. Um, instead of going t minus divided by 30, let's just do t divided by two. That's gonna make it quite a lot faster. I'm gonna refresh. And there we go. You can see that now the waves are actually traveling, especially like in this region, you can see that you know you're, the waves are going up and down. And if I zoom out so that we can see the whole image, yeah, that looks kind of cool, I think. So that that gives us some, some animation there. And why don't we also animate frequency while we're here as well? So um, we, can, we can sort of arbitrarily map the frequency to, to another sine wave. And the sine wave will take in our time. And I guess we need to divide time down, so. <laughs> Maybe we want to divide time down by like 30. And we know that goes between minus one and one. And we want the frequency to go, I don't know, between something like 20 and 200, let's say. So now we're actually modulating frequency as well as amplitude. So let's refresh that. And what we can see is that it gets like kind of like more dense and then slowly like slowly washes out so you almost can't see the image anymore. I bet YouTube's compression is, is doing terribly with this. And probably you can even see some like interesting like more artifacts that happen as you go through this. Like it's pretty interesting like as like as you get waves and you draw like lines on top of each other uh, close together you start to get these other artifacts coming on top of them. It's got sort of aliasing effects. Um, yeah, I think this looks pretty cool. It gets to the point, I think, where the frequency is higher than the pixel density, and therefore we start kind of almost drawing things on top of each other, uh, which actually has a nice effect of like increasing the density and making the image clearer. I guess the one last thing I want to show you that you could do is that you could actually allow your maximum amplitude to go higher than like just like the width of the screen. So if we allow the maximum amplitude to be twice as high, we can actually um, then refresh and you can see that now the waves actually overlap each other a bit. But because of that overlapping effect, we actually get a uh, higher contrast. And so, um, yeah, it actually increases like kind of the, the clarity of the image. Right. This is it. I think we've gone far enough. You can see uh, like what we've done. Uh, I think it's a really cool effect. You can take this effect that we've done in effectively in a, in a raster environment and you can take this and apply it in a shader. There's nothing that stops you from doing this like exact effect in a shader, um, which means that, well, I mean, I, I could imagine that there could be some really cool games that would use this visual style or at least, at least make some use of that. Maybe some already exist. Um, we might explore how you would port something like this to a shader in the future. I think that could be an interesting video. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. Let me know in the comments what you thought or if you've made any modifications. I really genuinely enjoy seeing what people do with these. So like, if you make something, please let me know. Um, if you don't enjoy these, you can also let me know. I might not respond to it. <laughs> but it's good to know the feedback in any case. All right. Thanks for watching.